It was a bitterly cold afternoon on January the 30th, 1649. A dignified, middle-aged man with dark hair and a fine white shirt was led onto a black draped stage surrounded by people. An enormous crowd had gathered despite the appalling weather because this would be no ordinary execution. The crowd stood transfixed as the man knelt and laid his neck on a wooden block. Moments later, the executioner's axe was raised high in the air and then came down with a sickening thud. The axe man bent over and picked up the severed head by its long dark hair to display to the crowd. King Charles I of England, Scotland and Ireland was dead and Europe would never be the same again. Now, while this moment is a milestone in English history, it's impossible to properly understand it outside of the Protestant Reformation, which made it possible. You're listening to Villains and Virgins podcast, and this is episode four in a series on the Protestant Reformation. Now, if you're just joining me, You should know there have been three previous episodes, beginning with the life of John Wycliffe in episode one, episode two focuses on Martin Luther, and episode three on the work and influence of John Calvin. This is episode four, and I'm going to say right at the outset that I've really taken on quite a lot to try and handle in one episode for you today. The focus of today's story is how England became Protestant. And so it's going to be a whirlwind tour of the beginnings of Protestant identity in England. And it's going to culminate with the execution of the English king, which we've just witnessed at the end of the English Civil War. This is a period of time that covers approximately a century and a half. So there's a lot of material and of necessity, I can't cover everything. So I'm going to be focusing on how the ideas of Protestant Christianity prepared the ground for the event that we've just witnessed. Now, in previous episodes, we've covered the explosion of the Protestant Reformation across Europe. Again, if this is your first exposure to the term, you should know that in Western Europe, until the Protestant Reformation emerges, there was only one kind of Christian, really, and they were called Roman Catholics. In, in Western Europe, this was Christianity. This is what it looked like. So you had a unified church under the authority of the Pope, who, with some variations, usually lived in Rome. As the Protestant Reformation takes off, we see the ideas of Martin Luther, John Calvin, and many others have enormous effects, particularly in Northern Europe, which is really where it initially catches fire. So Germany experiences radical changes as a result of the ideas of Martin Luther, for example. And these ideas spread elsewhere in Europe, including Switzerland, France, the Netherlands, and elsewhere. But England is a peculiar case, because unlike the rest of these countries, its arrival in the parade of Protestant countries initially had very little to do with conviction. And so I'm going to explain why that is. Now, you've of course heard of King Henry VIII of England, possibly that country's most notorious king. And you will have heard that he had a number of wives, most of whom came to unhappy endings. If you were really a fan of Henry VIII or you'd like to know more about him, I've done an entire series on him. Uh, You can look it up under Villains and Virgins podcasts. I'm going to try and condense my comments on Henry for today uh, just to the part that has to do with Protestant Christianity in England. So Henry's first wife, Catherine of Aragon, failed to produce a son. She did, however, give him a daughter named Mary. But Henry was very, very keen on having a son to inherit the throne. And it wasn't just because he had a preference for boys over girls. It was because... His father had created the Tudor dynasty. Henry VIII was only its second king, and that dynasty had been created at the point of the sword on a battlefield. It was hotly contested, and it hadn't been hallowed by time and tradition. So if Henry VIII didn't have a son to pass his crown and his throne down to, it was highly unlikely that the Tudor dynasty would outlast Henry VIII himself. 
there were plenty of other nobles and contenders for the throne in England at the time, and it seemed very likely that without a very clear male heir, the throne would be likely to be contested. So Henry was focused on defending and preserving the crown that had been passed down to him, and in order to do this, he needed to have a son. So Henry appealed to the Pope for an annulment of his marriage. An annulment was basically a pronouncement that said, your marriage is dissolved, it's as though it never was. And this was because divorce was extremely rare. Uh, on, there were certain occasions in which it could happen, but it was basically against church teaching, extremely hard to come by. But there were certain circumstances under which a marriage could be annulled, the Pope had done this for other uh, heads of state, for example, under particular circumstances, and so Henry was appealing to this precedent. Henry's argument was that his wife, Catherine, had not been a virgin when he married her. And it wasn't a hard argument to make because Catherine had previously been married to Henry VIII's older brother, Arthur. You never heard much about him because Arthur was quite sick when he married Catherine and he died about five months after their marriage. Both Arthur and Catherine were very young at the time, in their late teens, most likely. And so Henry said, well, I am I married my brother's widow, so of course she wasn't a virgin. And this hadn't been a problem for Henry at the time, and it hadn't been a problem for Henry uh, for many years of marriage. But now that it seemed extremely unlikely that Catherine could produce a son, because she was nearing the end of her biologically fertile period, uh, Henry was making this, this argument that, oh yes, she's my brother's wife, and I've just realized that this was a terrible sin for me to marry my, my brother's widow. And so Henry actually used certain verses from the Old Testament in the Bible to support the case he was making to the Pope. So Henry quoted from Leviticus chapter 18, verse 16, and chapter 20, verses 21, uh, which are verses that suggest that it's a sin for a man to have sexual relations with his brother's wife. So these pangs of conscience that Henry was now feeling and these verses that he was quoting were really just instrumental in making his case. Henry had lots of reasons for, at this moment, desiring to get rid of his wife, and her childlessness was only one of them. However, before we get to that, his wife, Catherine of Aragon, was the child of two of the most powerful sovereigns in Europe, Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain. Spain was a wealthier country and far more powerful than England and Europe at this time. So Henry's marriage to Catherine had been extremely valuable in terms of uh, alliances, in terms of political capital, and Henry couldn't just get rid of Catherine because he felt like it. It would be a serious thing to offend her parents, so he needed to go through the proper channels. And this is why we find him quoting scripture here. Now Catherine, for her part, was extremely unhappy about this idea of being divorced. She had been a faithful and outstanding royal spouse for a number of years, and not just someone who stayed at home and did needlework. She had led armies to defend England when Henry was fighting wars abroad. She'd been a very, very able queen, and she was much loved by her English subjects. She thought that her husband's plan to get rid of her was unjust and extremely offensive and wrong. So she made a counterclaim to the Pope against her husband's uh, bid for an annulment, and she said, that she had in fact been a virgin when she married Henry, and therefore all these verses about sleeping with a woman who had slept with his brother were basically irrelevant. Now, this put the Pope in a very difficult situation, because not only was Catherine the daughter of the King and Queen of Spain, but she was also related to Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, who was an extremely powerful military figure in Europe at the time. And so doing something that would anger Catherine and her allies put the Pope in a very difficult situation. But it was not convenient to alienate the King of England either. So what did the Pope do? Well, he dithered. He dithered for seven long years, during which time he kept Henry busy by sending papers back and forth, sending papal emissaries to England to hear the various cases and travel back 
to Italy and discuss with the Pope and travel back to England. And so all these procedures and all these administrative maneuverings were basically designed to prevent the Pope from having to make a very difficult and costly decision either way. Seven years was a long time to wait for a man who was in love with another woman. And this man was Henry VIII. So he didn't just need to get rid of Catherine because she couldn't give him a son. He needed to replace her with another woman who could. And he thought he had found that woman in Anne Boleyn. So Anne Boleyn had been a woman at court. Henry had encountered her there. Uh, he was incredibly enamored of her and she had become his mistress. Henry was madly in love with Anne Boleyn and bent on making her his queen so that she could produce the male heir that he so desired. It's perhaps not surprising under these circumstances that the King of England would begin to find the views of a German Protestant called Martin Luther convenient at least on the surface of it, because Martin Luther, one of the leaders of this Protestant Reformation we've been talking about, was busy preaching up and down Germany and the rest of Europe that the Pope wasn't the ultimate authority in Christian religion, that actually individuals could read the Bible for themselves and see what they ought to do, and that this idea of absolute obedience to the Pope was unnecessary and actually quite wrong. So perhaps, Henry VIII thought, perhaps he didn't have to wait for the Pope's permission after all. Now, for Henry VIII, this is actually a more shocking move than you might think. Because years earlier, as a young man, when this very same Martin Luther in Germany had said these very same things about the Pope, Henry VIII had sprung to the defense of the leader of the Western Christian Church. He had written a public rebuke to Martin Luther, defending the authority of the Pope against these heretical ideas that Martin Luther was spreading. These same ideas that were the seeds of the Protestant Reformation. And the Pope had rewarded the King of England with the title Defender of the Faith. But that was 1521. Henry had fallen in love with Anne Boleyn in 1526, and it was about 1532, while he was still waiting for the Pope's response to his request for an annulment, that he discovered that Anne, his mistress, was pregnant. Now, Henry was in a furious rush to put a ring on her finger so that the child that she was going to produce could be his legitimate heir. This could be the son that he'd been waiting for for so long. So under these circumstances, it's perhaps not shocking that Henry would turn and use the very ideas from Martin Luther that he himself had condemned so publicly back in 1521. So early in 1533, Henry hastily marries Anne Boleyn without any permission from the Pope. Instead, he turns to the highest ranking churchman in England the Archbishop of Canterbury, and gets him to officiate the wedding. Now, of course, in order for these changes to mean anything, Henry was going to have to change a lot of rules, because, of course, the Archbishop of Canterbury was underneath the Pope in the hierarchy, and his authority was not greater than that of the Pope. So in order for the Archbishop's permission and officiation of this wedding to make sense, Henry was going to have to do some radical revisions, and that's exactly what he did. To formalize this new arrangement with his new queen, Henry got the English Parliament to pass two very important pieces of legislation. One was the Act of Supremacy, in which Henry had himself declared as head of the Church of England. So he's removed the Pope from the top of the hierarchy, and he's put himself in the Pope's place. He, the king, is now the ultimate authority for both the state and the English church. This is how the Church of England was created. The second piece of legislation was the Act of Succession, in which the king required all of his subjects to publicly acknowledge that his previous marriage to Catherine of Aragon was illegitimate, that any children he'd had from that marriage were also illegitimate, 
and that any children he would now have with his new wife, Anne, were his legitimate heirs and Anne was the rightful Queen of England. This piece of legislation was really very controversial, especially because Henry already had a child from his previous marriage, Princess Mary. She was very well known, and so he was essentially declaring his first child a bastard, an illegitimate offspring who could not inherit the throne and could not even formally be referred to as a princess anymore. Needless to say, there were many devout Christians in England who thought the actions of their king were absolutely horrifying. He had ejected their rightful queen and replaced her with his mistress, whom many referred to around the dinner table as that witch, Anne Boleyn. She was an incredibly unpopular figure for many English people at this time. He had disinherited his own living daughter in favor of potential uh, offspring from this new marriage. And to make matters worse, the king then set about seizing and confiscating church property. You know, things like monasteries, shrines, churches, places where a lot of property and precious objects, wealth, uh, resided. They had formerly been the property of the church, which was ultimately headed by the Pope. But because Henry had cut off the church in England from the Catholic Church and put it under his own authority, he felt empowered to do whatever he wanted with the property associated with the church in England, which was now the Church of England, or should we say the Church of Henry VIII. So, these actions rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, but disagreeing with Henry VIII openly was an extremely dangerous thing to do, and a number of prominent men paid with their lives for doing so. Thomas More, the subject of the famous play A Man for All Seasons by Robert Bolt, uh, met his end. He was executed because he refused to take the oath of succession to affirm that Anne Boleyn was the rightful queen and that her children were the rightful heirs. He said, this is wrong. I'm not going to sign it. I'm not going to affirm these words. It's against my conscience and you can't make me. So the king beheaded Thomas More after a long campaign to try to get him to go along uh, because it was very inconvenient to have such a prominent man stand against the king in this way. But he did and he paid with his life. Bishop Fisher was another prominent churchman in England who also opposed these actions of King Henry VIII and was also executed. But there were a large number of others who were not nearly so prominent or famous who also suffered violence and death for failing to comply with the king's new laws. As a result of these actions, the Pope threatened Henry VIII with excommunication in 1535. What that basically means is being kicked out of the Christian church. And this was actually really serious because if you were an excommunicate as a king, it meant that you were outside. You were not a Christian. You were outside of grace. You were in, in fact damned unless you repented and were accepted back in and had excommunication lifted or reversed. And so if you were an excommunicate as a monarch, your nobles and your people could be totally justified. Indeed, they might have a moral duty to resist and replace you. So it was a very serious thing. And then the Pope makes this threat in 1535, but Henry at this point has gone too far down the road to, to return. He's, he's made his decision and he's going to stick to it. So he's not repenting. He's not going back. He's not recognizing the authority of the Pope. He doesn't care about being accepted back into the Christian fold under the authority of the Pope, partly because he's seen that ideas have changed and that across Europe there are many other people who are now questioning the authority of the Pope and so perhaps excommunication won't be taken as seriously as it would have in the past. So Henry is finally excommunicated formally in 1538 and at that moment he joins the ranks of Martin Luther and Protestants, uh, these, these reform-minded Christians across Europe, who have also said that, you know, the Pope doesn't own the Christian Church, and that it's possible to be a Christian and be outside 
of the institutional Roman Catholic Church and not subject to the Pope's authority. So times have changed. And England is now officially a Protestant country, but it's Protestant in a very different way than, say, Switzerland or Germany. It became Protestant because it was politically and personally convenient for King Henry VIII to achieve his dynastic and sexual goals. Protestantism, or Reform Christianity, simply provided a convenient way for Henry to achieve these objectives. He was not particularly moved by the theological debates that animated reformers like John Calvin and Martin Luther in their revised understanding of what Christianity was and how it should be practiced, the kind of debates they were having about What's the proper way to have communion? Do we really believe that there's a miracle that happens in which the bread and wine are physically transformed into the literal body and blood of Jesus Christ? Or is it just a symbolic thing? These debates and, and lots of writing and very, very heated controversy around these subjects was spreading all over Europe as reform Christians began to try to define what Christianity was without referring to the pronouncements of the Pope. But Henry wasn't interested in this, and none of that had any role to play in why England became Protestant. In fact, King Henry VIII remained very traditional, very Catholic even, in his personal practices, uh, despite being officially excommunicated and a rebel from the Pope. And so too did many of his subjects, who now, bewilderingly, found themselves members of the Church of England, but whose ideas and whose religious traditions hadn't essentially changed from the Catholic practices that they'd had for centuries. In the rest of Europe, where Protestant ideas were expanding like wildfire, they were actually beginning to overturn the medieval social order. Now, what do I mean by medieval social order? Let me explain. Up until this point, societies had been organized under two separate but overlapping institutions. One was the state, with the king at the apex, and the state had its own lines of authority. It had its courts and systems for collecting revenue through taxes. And then there was the institutional church, the Roman Catholic Church, and at its head was the pope. It also had its own system of officials. Archbishops, for example, who were in charge of different countries and presided over bishops in major cities, who in turn presided over local parishes or communities that were headed by community priests. So the church was a very complex institutional structure and it had its own revenue collection system, tithing. It also had its own courts. So if you had a church official, such as a bishop or a priest, who got into trouble for doing something wrong, he wasn't going to the court run by the judge under the authority of the king. He was going to an ecclesiastical or church court, which was staffed by other church officials. So, so these two institutions were overlapping. In a particular jurisdiction, say Germany, for example, the individual citizen would be paying taxes to the king, but he'd also be paying tithes to his local priest. So the taxes would go up the chain and they would go into the state tax collection, but tithes would go back through the church hierarchy back to Rome, ultimately. So these two institutions were the pillars of the medieval social order. And very often they were mutually reinforcing. The church would affirm the authority of the king and the importance of, you know, being obedient to him. And the king would affirm the authority of the church and so on. But there were occasions in which there was conflict between these two institutions. But more or less, very, very briefly, that's what it looked like. Protestant ideas essentially attack the church pillar of that social order. Because Protestant thinkers say, you know what, we don't need most of that. We can just get rid of it. We don't think that the Pope should be in charge of anything. We don't think that his authority should be what defines Christianity. And we don't like the way church offices are distributed, you know, the decisions that are being made over who becomes an archbishop or a bishop or a priest. 
we think there's a lot of corruption there, so we're going to get rid of that. Um, and instead of it, we're going to have very local churches or congregations of people that gather together, and they're going to have their own minister or pastor, if you like, not priest. And this man is going to be in charge of instructing people or trying to teach them what Christianity looks like and how they should apply it in their lives, not based on centuries of tradition or theological writings, but basically through looking at the text of the Bible itself and elaborating or expounding what that means. So Protestantism has this radically individualistic focus that says you don't need a, an authority, you don't need centuries of tradition to instruct you in what Christianity means. You just need to read the text for yourself and probably go to a local church where you can just, you know, hear the teachings of your pastor or minister who basically it's his full-time job to be studying it. And that's it. So the authority of the church hierarchy and the respect for people who held office there is essentially under of this violent attack. Now, while Protestants in Europe are attacking the institutional authority of the Roman Catholic Church, many of them, at least in the early days, are very strongly affirming the authority of the local state. And that's because they need the protection of state authorities to exist. Guys like Martin Luther and John Calvin would, in earlier days, have been rounded up as heretics, people who were teaching wrong religious ideas, dangerous ideas, and they would have been executed, probably by burning at the stake, under church authority. That's how things had worked for centuries. But at this moment, as this Protestant Reformation is taking off, it's basically being given a shelter by local uh, state authorities, particularly in Germany. And so, in return, a lot of Protestant thinkers like Martin Luther are saying it's very important that uh, Reformed Protestant Christians uh, respect the authority of the state and are, and are good, obedient citizens. That's how it begins. But it's inevitable that this style of thinking, which essentially does not pay respect to anybody based on their position or their rank, this attitude of measuring church officials against an idea about Christianity that comes out of your own reading of the Bible, wasn't going to remain limited to church officials forever. It couldn't. So while Protestants began by demolishing the institutional Christian church and saying we need to measure everybody by the Bible and how we understand it, it was only a matter of time before they would take the same ideas and begin to apply them to their understanding of political figures as well. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's zoom back in on England for a moment. One of the most vigorous proponents of this new reformed protesting or Protestant Christianity was a guy called John Knox. And he was from Scotland, which is not in England, I know. It's to the north of England, but he's going to enter England in just a moment. So John Knox is transmitting these ideas that are coming out of Europe, and he's very, very loudly spreading them in Scotland, which is still a Catholic country at this time. England has become officially Church of England or Protestant, but it's just a political label. Scotland is still Catholic, but John Knox is transmitting these Protestant ideas from Europe through Scotland as a member of what is going to be known as the Scottish Reform Movement. When Henry VIII dies, he's briefly succeeded by his nine-year-old son, Edward VI, who's obviously still a child, but has been raised very firmly Protestant from childhood. He had no experience of a church that was under the authority of the Pope or anything like that, he'd been raised in a country that had already become officially Protestant thanks to his dad. And while his father, Henry VIII, was still a traditionalist in many ways and a Protestant of convenience, his son, Edward VI, was surrounded by a strong group of nobles, many of whom were inspired by these reformist ideas, these Protestant concepts. And so with their support and encouragement and instruction, the young King Edward 
forwards this very ambitious program of church reform in England. You see, the Church of England wasn't under the authority of the Pope anymore, but in many ways, nothing much had changed in the day-to-day -day experience of most people who were practicing Christians in England. Under Edward VI, there is this wholesale attempt to transform that. So, if you go into a church in Italy, a Catholic country, you'll be amazed and dazzled by the beauty of the interiors. You see stained glass windows, beautiful domes, uh, statues, paintings, carvings, relics in, in gold and bejeweled boxes, all these sorts of things. And there was a time when you could have seen similar things in England as well. But Protestant ideas suggested that all of this ornamentation, all of this art, was actually a distraction. That it caused people to focus on images of Mary or other humans, even if they might have been called saints, rather than this more abstract idea of God. And so these Protestants wanted to get rid of most of this decoration. So when King Edward and his Protestant nobles uh, push this reform agenda, they're trying to strip out the stained glass, the paintings, the statues from churches in England. Also, whereas priests in the Catholic Church had been expected to be celibate, uh, this new reform program in England wants to have uh, priests who can marry. And finally, instead of having your service in Latin, as had been the tradition under the Catholic Church for centuries, uh, they want to have this Book of Common Prayer in which the, the prayers and the other ceremonies in church will be conducted in English. Now, this is not necessarily very popular with most English Christians at the time, who had been forced to put up with a church that was separated from the authority of the Pope and under the authority of the King, but had otherwise been able to maintain most of their practices just as they were. So in the early 1550s, John Knox, that Scottish reformer that I just introduced you to, was actually hired by the young English king and his Protestant nobles as a missionary to travel around England and to spread these reform ideas in various parts to the north of England, basically trying to popularize Protestant thought so that they could get greater uh, local acceptance for these reforms. This is basically an evangelizing mission to convert English Christians into Protestant-style Christians. So to, to change their practice from traditions of Catholic Christianity into this newer, reformed Protestant version. Now, this moment of zeal in the English government passed uh, after about six years when young King Edward died at the untimely age of 15. And in many ways, the Church of England remained largely what it always had been. People today know it as the Anglican Church. And if you look at what goes on in an Anglican Church, it resembles much more what you'd see in Catholic churches complete with the robes that the priest will wear and the, the way that the ceremonies are conducted, it looks much more Catholic than it does Protestant and what you'd expect to find in Protestant churches across Europe or North America. So why the Anglican Church and the Church of England is the way it is, is found directly at this moment of history right here. When the boy king, Edward VI, died, he was succeeded by his half-sister, and Henry VIII's oldest child, Mary Tudor. Now, Mary was the daughter of the very Spanish and very Catholic Catherine of Aragon. So she saw it as her mission to undo the misguided policies of her half-brother Edward and her father Henry VIII. Unlike them, she had remained a staunch Catholic like her mother and a supporter of the old faith, the true church, as she saw it. So when Mary became queen, she did a 180 degree pivot. And suddenly, instead of the English crown paying missionaries like John Knox to Protestantize England, Mary Tudor was busy driving Protestants out of England, and in some cases, burning them at the stake. So she re-empowers 
the Catholics of the realm and tries to undo all of the policies that have been in place for the last several years. You can imagine what whiplash the average English citizen would have had uh, having the, the church change around them under the reign of Henry VIII, then being bombarded by these radical Protestant ideas from Europe under Edward, only to suddenly pivot and be told that everything had to be as traditionally Catholic as it ever was, even though there'd been now decades of change. So it was extremely disconcerting for many people, and it was a wild fluctuation in terms of political power as Protestant noble families who had been empowered under Edward were suddenly displaced and replaced by staunch Catholic individuals. While Edward's policies had been perhaps too Protestant for a number of people, there had nevertheless, since Henry's time, been a growing number of people in England who had been influenced by Protestant ideas from Europe. They were reading uh, Protestant uh, letters and, and written materials that were being pirated into England. There was a growing movement of people who had become Protestants because they were really inspired by the ideas. So for these people, suddenly returning to Catholicism was unthinkable. And there was also a significant number of noble families in England who were also reluctant to return to the old ways because they had benefited personally from King Henry VIII's confiscation of Catholic Church property. He had doled out parcels of land that he'd confiscated from the church and bestowed some of them on his supporters among the aristocracy. So these people were understandably very unenthusiastic about returning England to the authority of the Pope, because that would mean they had to hand back the Pope's property, and they weren't really fans of that idea. So while Mary, as Queen, did her utmost to return England to the authority of the Pope and to rejoin the larger Catholic Church, ultimately her project failed. But during her time as Queen, some of the more extreme Protestants, including John Knox, fled the country because there had been quite a number of Protestants who were burned at the stake for failing to return to Catholic ways and to attend Mass and to outwardly profess the more traditional version of Christianity that Mary was supporting. And so for those people who felt that that was just unthinkable and weren't willing to sort of pretend to, to go along, a large number of them left the country and they went to Protestant states in Europe including places like uh, Geneva in Switzerland or other Protestant cities uh, in Switzerland and Germany. And of course, while they were there, they, they absorbed even more of the latest in the terms of the Protestant reform movement's ideas. And they would bring these ideas back with them to England in very short order. I say short order because Mary was only queen for a handful of years. By 1558, she died most likely of a form of cancer, and so the throne was inherited by the only remaining child of Henry VIII, and that was Elizabeth. It was this Elizabeth, during whose rule England defeats the Spanish Armada and begins its rise to power that is going to culminate in the foundations of the British Empire. So a very, very famous queen, but she's the daughter of Anne Boleyn, Henry VIII's mistress and infamous second queen. And Elizabeth has been raised sort of in between. Her mother Anne was by most accounts a Protestant, or at least extremely supportive of the spread of Protestant ideas in England. And so Elizabeth is exposed to that at a very early age. But she's also been witness as a young woman to the extreme violence of England's shift from a sort of middle church of England to a more extreme version of Protestantism and then the attempted return to Catholicism. So when she becomes queen, she attempts to take a very difficult middle path, a path which accommodates differences of belief as long as all of her subjects stay loyal to her alone, which is a difficult line to walk. It's difficult because uh, she also is excommunicated by the Pope for failing to be a Catholic monarch, 
and this is a situation that creates a conflict of loyalty for her Catholic citizens. So there is a whole chapter that could be done on Catholic and Protestant during the reign of, El of Elizabeth that we don't have time to go into here. But the point I want to make is that when Elizabeth takes the throne, there's a more moderate climate overall that prevails, even though visiting Catholic priests who are being harbored by old faith Catholic aristocratic families still have to hide uh, in, in order to, to stay alive because they're seen as agents of, uh, of Catholic plots to perhaps overthrow the queen. Not without reason, but I digress. During Elizabeth's reign, a number of the expats or the English Protestants who'd left the country under the reign of Mary for Protestant Europe begin to return. And with them, they bring a sort of renewed vitality to Protestant ideas in England, which only create deeper roots for, for that way of understanding Christianity. England is now a country divided. There are people of the old faith, uh, English people who continue to hold true to the Catholic traditions that uh, existed before Henry VIII, and they retain their connection to these things despite the political changes in their country. So these people see the only true faith as the traditional church with the Pope as its supreme authority. So that's one camp. Then there are the reformers, the more zealous Protestant ideologues, especially those who've come back from Europe into England, and they see England as not Protestant enough. They, they think that further reforms are needed to bring England into line with the latest waves of reform thinking in Europe. And in the middle, there's the Church of England, a centrist state church with the Queen as its official head, which really pleases nobody. It's too Catholic for the reformers, and it's not Catholic enough for people of the old faith because it's not under the authority of the Pope, and it's subject only to the authority of the monarch and the Archbishop of Canterbury, who's the, now the highest ranking church official in England. So the balance of power and influence is going to waver uneasily amongst these three factions, and these are the parties that are on the playing board for the next chapter that's about to unfold. So keep in mind, the Church of England pleases nobody. It's a halfway house between the hardcore Protestant reformers and the Catholic traditionalists. Meanwhile, in the area and the neighborhood around England, um, Ireland had remained Catholic. But Scotland, by 1560, only a couple years after Elizabeth I becomes queen, becomes officially Protestant. And this is due in large part to the teachings of men like John Knox and others like him in the Scottish reform movement who have seeded reform ideas throughout Scotland to the point where there's enough of a critical mass of the population to change the identity of the country. So in 1560, the Scottish Parliament adopts a Protestant declaration of faith. And at this point, they have changed their identity from Catholic to Protestant. And if, if you look at a map of Europe at this time, it's sort of a, a mixed board of uh, states that are, many of them still Catholic, uh, especially those like Spain and Italy, and France is officially Catholic. And then there are places that are Protestant, usually smaller pockets or uh, territories within units that later become nation states. Germany is not a nation at that time. It's a collection of smaller areas like Bavaria and, and so on. So amongst these smaller regions, some of them are Protestant and some of them are Catholic and the colors are beginning to change. And here in the British Isles, you have England in the middle, which is officially Protestant, but has a very Catholic color shade. And now Scotland on one side has turned color and become Protestant and Ireland remains staunchly Catholic. And these are not just religious orientations, they have political implications. Most notably in the wars of religion, which we're gonna cover in our next episode, so stay tuned for that, but even just immediately for England itself, as we're going to see. For Scotland, this switch over to a Protestant identity didn't happen without armed conflict. 
Protestant-leaning Scots led a military uprising against a Catholic regent queen in Scotland at the time, and they won. It was only in the wake of that battle that you have the Scottish Parliament then making this religious declaration. And so what we're going to see is that the politics of these countries are inextricably connected to the shifts in religious identity. And religious identity also is going to be linked to a preference for certain forms of political arrangement or orientation. And we're going to see that really unfold in England in the next couple of decades. So here we go. Queen Elizabeth, as you may remember from the many films that have been made about her, uh, was called the Virgin Queen. And whether or not she ever actually had any kind of sexual contact with anybody, we can't be sure. It seems unlikely that she was actually a virgin. But the, the title is given to her because she refuses to be married and she never has any children which of course complicates matters when she dies, because it means that she has no direct heir uh, to bestow the crown on. So the throne of England is inherited by one of Elizabeth's relatives, James. James is the son of Elizabeth's cousin, Mary, Queen of Scots, who Elizabeth has executed actually for a, a political plot against Elizabeth's life at one point. But nevertheless, James is her closest surviving relative. So when Elizabeth dies, this young Scottish king becomes the king of both Scotland and England. So we've just had a dynastic switch. The Tudor line coming from Henry VIII and his father is over, and it's being passed a couple of steps laterally uh, to Elizabeth's cousin James, and now we have the Stuart dynasty that uh, comes into power in England. Now James was already familiar with the troubles that Protestant ideas posed for monarchs and that's because he was already the King of Scotland and as you've just learned Scotland became Protestant because of fierce conviction because there were plenty of Scots uh, that really embraced the ideas of Reformed Christianity and thought that the, the traditional Catholic Church needed a radical overhaul. And so when Scotland becomes Protestant, it's a full-blooded conversion in the same way that it was in, in Germany and other parts of Northern Europe. But the Protestant tendency to be not deferential to religious authority also extends to Protestant ideas toward the authority of kings, as it turns out. And so James I had already inherited a very, very troublesome Protestant Scottish nobles who got very uppity about what the king was allowed to do and not allowed to do and what they saw as their religious rights and limitations that they were beginning to say should apply to what the king could do. That their religious freedoms as Protestant Christians were something that had to be protected and not even the king could cross certain lines. So this is very troublesome for a monarch, and it's a very Protestant kind of idea. James recognized the tension between these religious positions and political implications, and he said famously, no bishop, no king, which basically means if we don't recognize the authority of the church hierarchy, what's going to become of the hierarchy that has the king at the top of it? So in a statement that very much recognizes that old medieval social order that we talked about earlier, James sees his own authority as a monarch being threatened by some of these uppity Protestants who have already demolished uh, the institutional Christian church in Scotland and are busy sort of sharpening their knives against things that the king might have in mind. Now, this is the same James who, when he becomes king of England, uh, commissions the very famous King James Version of the Bible, that translation of the Bible into English in 1611. Same guy. He's famous for commissioning that translation, but also for an idea which is very medieval, but that he believed in, and it was called the divine right of kings. So James basically saw himself as king because it was the will of God. So the implications of that are 
I am your ruler because God wants me to be your ruler. God put me in charge. And therefore, I have the right to make whatever laws I see fit. I am answerable only to God. So the king answers only to God. Your duty as a subject of this king is absolute obedience. Disobedience to the king on this view is the same as disobedience to God. Because it is God's will that this is your king, and therefore if you disobey the king, you step out of line with the will of God. It's a very convenient political theory, it must be admitted. Very convenient for kings. But this was something that James uh, frequently articulated. It's how he saw himself, and it's how he wanted other people to see him, more importantly. During his reign, King James tried to balance the tensions amongst these different religious factions in England. There were the centrists, the sort of institutional Church of England types. There were the old faith Catholics, especially amongst the aristocracy, who hoped that King James and his Catholic wife would help nudge England back towards the true faith. And then there were the hardline Protestant reformers, people who were going to be derisively labeled Puritans because nothing was ever pure enough for them. The Church of England needed reform. Everything needed reform. Uh, no one was as pure as they wanted England to be. And so they wanted even more extreme revisions to the practice of the Church of England. So amongst these competing factions, there were church officials, there were nobles, uh, and all, all kinds of people at court who belonged to these different uh, factions and hoped that the king would privilege or advance their agendas. It was a very difficult scenario to be in. James did his best to keep the peace by giving everybody a sense of hope without actually delivering on many of the promises or the, or the half promises that, that he, would, he would pass around to pacify people. When King James died, he was succeeded in 1625 by his son Charles, who became known as Charles I. And yes, this is the same Charles whose execution began this episode. It's during the reign of this King Charles that the inevitable explosion is going to happen where new religious ideas impact the way that government is going to be done in England. Charles was what one would call very high church, by which we mean he was a member of the Church of England, but really very, very traditional, almost indistinguishable from an old faith Catholic in practice. His mother was, after all, a Catholic, and so he was very much raised by her. But in addition to inheriting his mother's religious sensibilities, Charles had inherited his father's hardline ideas about the divine right of kings, his own absolute authority as the symbol of God's will and the duty of everybody around him to give him absolute obedience. He saw himself as the only one who had the authority to make laws and all of his subjects were bound religiously and politically to obey him. Needless to say, he wasn't particularly concerned about popular opinion, and this is going to get him into a lot of trouble. Now, Charles did a number of things that immediately inflamed the delicate balance of religious sensitivities in England and Scotland. First of all, he married a French princess, Henrietta Maria. So she was Catholic. And when she became Queen of England, she had uh, Capuchin monks very publicly performing mass so that she could have her religious observances near the palace. And for the first time since the reign of Henry VIII, there was a papal representative or an emissary of the Pope stationed in the English court. Now, a great many people in the English court and England at large saw these as very ominous signs. Was the king secretly a Catholic? His wife was very openly a Catholic. And was he trying to steer the country back in the direction of the old faith and subservience to the Pope? 
This would have been difficult enough under Mary Tudor a couple of generations ago, but now, when Protestant ideas were far more deeply rooted in England and had completely taken over in Scotland, it was an extremely explosive idea. To make matters worse, King Charles I thought that meeting with his English Parliament was troublesome, boring, and a waste of time. Why should he need to talk to Parliament about anything, actually? I mean, he was the king. Their duty was just to rubber stamp whatever he wanted to do, any law that he wanted to make. He saw them as basically useless, uh, a, a troublesome and symbolic formality at best. But the problem was, he needed parliamentary approval to raise money in order to be able to use English tax dollars or to acquire more uh, revenue from his subjects, he needed Parliament to approve it. This was how English government was done. Now, the King's sentiments weren't hidden from anybody. In fact, a Parliament presented the King in 1628 with a document called the Petition of Right, which basically said that he should stop summoning Parliament only when he wanted to acquire more money. And in addition to that demand, they said that he should stop imprisoning people without trial and using martial law against civilians. Now, these things sound completely basic to you and I, because we live in a post-monarchy society. Even countries like England that still have monarchs are essentially post-monarchy, because the amount of power that the English monarchs have now is so tiny that it's really just symbolic. But at this moment, when you think about the demands and the petition of right, you get a sense of just how large the king's range of power was. That he was throwing people into jail without any trial, there was no need for evidence. If the king said so, that was it. You could rot in a dungeon until you expired there. He, he was using soldiers against civilians. There, there was no effective limitation on what he could do. And this didn't sit well with the English, because they had a history of slowly and laboriously struggling to limit the absolute power of kings. In fact, if you go back to our very first episode on John Wycliffe, you will recall that in the 1370s, the emerging, the developing version of the English Parliament, which was then in its infancy, was sending petitions to the House of Lords or the nobles demanding accountability for abuses from the king's mistress and some of his officials. So this had been going on for 300 years. The English saying that, no, the king just can't do whatever he wants, that he needs to be answerable to representatives of the people. And we don't have time to go through all the different limitations and events that had influenced this tradition. But by the time we're looking at 1628, the English think that it's outrageous that the king is just you know, summoning parliament to rubber stamp his, his demands for money. So they're putting their dismay in this formal petition and presenting it to the king. But Charles has no interest. He doesn't care a fig for English traditions of government or for limitations on his absolute power as a monarch. So he does something that becomes a very bad habit. He basically will summon parliament when he absolutely has to, to raise money. The Parliament will make other demands, such as the King can't do this, can't do that, should do this, should do that. The King would promise them whatever he felt he absolutely had to. And then once Parliament was dismissed, he would promptly turn around, forget whatever he'd said, and continue doing exactly as he wanted until the money ran out and he needed to summon Parliament again. For 11 years solid, from 1629 to 1640, King Charles didn't even summon Parliament at all. He simply ruled the country by personal decree. And this period is derisively referred to as the period of personal rule uh, by, by English historians. It was, it was outrageous. The English and Scottish saw this dictatorship of the king as tyrannical and regressive. Since the Magna Carta back in the 11th century, English nobles had been deliberately putting constraints on the powers of their kings. Because whenever they had a ruler who had the power to do whatever he wanted, that's exactly what happened. And 
People who were inconvenient or who displeased the king were made to disappear, their lands were confiscated, their families were destroyed, nobody was safe. So England and Scotland had learned this the hard way, England in particular. And to see a king in 1629 or 1630 attempt to take England back to the middle of the Middle Ages, when they had begun this process of limiting the king and making him accountable, well, it was absolutely infuriating. Now, in addition to antagonizing the English, who thought the king was contemptuous of parliament and the rule of law and English freedom, Scotland had its own bone to pick with King Charles I. King Charles had his Archbishop of England, the Church of England, a man named William Laud, and he was trying to bring Scotland more into line with Church of England practices. Now, if you've been listening to anything I've said up to this point, some alarm bells should be going off in your mind because Church of England practices were a lot more Catholic than they were Protestant in practice. And Scotland was a hardcore, hard fought Protestant place. A place that had become Protestant on a battlefield. And so to have a king and his archbishop begin to dictate policies from London saying, oh yes, from now on, across the realm in England and Scotland, church is going to be done like this, and we have some new prayer books for you, and we have some new rules about how all the churches are going to function. The Scots saw this as a direct assault on their recent hard-won religious identity and freedom. So that went over like a lead balloon north of England. Now, Scotland already had its own church. And they had had, for quite some time now, they called it a kirk. They weren't particularly interested in being Church of England, or England anything really. They saw the English king as having ultimate political authority, but they had no tradition of recognizing him as being in charge of religious authority and religious practice. That was an English problem. The Scots had never accepted that idea. These Protestant Scots saw God as the supreme head of the church, and how could we know what God wanted or what God's will was? Well, in a very Protestant way, we would read the Bible and we would deduce from there what God wanted us to do. And if the king was saying something that Scottish Protestants couldn't find biblical support for, the king was wrong. It was that simple. And so for Scottish Protestants, the standardization of religious practice, the Church of England-ifying uh, of Scotland was extremely upsetting, to put it gently. There were some Scots who had even fought against Catholic countries elsewhere in Europe during the Thirty Years' War from 1618 to 1648. And we're going to talk a lot more about that in the next episode. But my point is, you have people who are living in Scotland at this time who have actually been on battlefields in Europe fighting Catholic countries in defense of Protestant identity. Imagine how these people felt watching an English king attempt to make Scotland look more Catholic. If your guess is that it made them think violent thoughts, you would be correct. And it wasn't long before those violent thoughts turned into violent actions. Most of all, the Scottish Church had been shaped by the ideas of John Knox and the Scottish Reform Movement. John Knox had spread the idea that it was the duty of Christians to resist any ruler who suppressed the true religion, by which he meant Protestant Reformed Christianity. So here we have this moment where religious loyalties and religious freedoms are put above even the political authority of the king. That's the outcome of John Knox's thinking, that the ultimate duty and loyalty of the Christian citizen is to the fidelity of his Christian faith. And if that means resisting the king, then that's what it means. Consequently, when King Charles I and his English Archbishop, William Laud, began to try and replace John Knox's Scottish Protestant prayer book with one that was more traditional and English, and also to promulgate a policy that said anyone who failed to recognize the king as the head of the church was going to be excommunicated or kicked out of the church, 
these were fighting words. These were things that were absolutely unthinkable for Scottish Protestants. By 1638, in response to these outrageous policies from England, members of the Scottish Reform Movement met to sign a national covenant reaffirming their Scottish Reform identity and vowing to resist any popish changes. Anything that looked to them at all Church of England or Catholic. And it was at this moment that the Scottish reformers became known as the Covenanters, because a covenant is a term that comes from the Old Testament in the Bible, and it's the most solemn form of an agreement that you can make. And so drawing directly from the text of scripture itself, they make this sort of solemn vow that they're going to defend their religious identity and freedoms even against the authority of the king. The General Assembly of Scotland went even further. They ejected the bishops who had been appointed by the King of England, and they affirmed their own authority to meet every year to decide on policy for the Church of England without the king's permission. They weren't asking him for permission. In their eyes, they didn't need it because the King of England was not the head of the, of the church in Scotland. It was a direct conflict between church and state. And King Charles decided he was going to try and crush the rebellious Scots with an army. So he sent in an army from England uh, and his, his goal was to absolutely subjugate the Scots and force them to conform to his rules. This conflict is known as the First Bishops' War in 1639. Unfortunately, King Charles still wasn't meeting with his English Parliament, because this is 1639. It's, uh, it's been 10 years of the period of personal rule or dictatorship, and he's beginning to run out of money. And because he's not meeting with Parliament, uh, he's having trouble raising more funds in order to support this war against the rebellious Scots. So as a result, the king has to basically cease his activities because he can't support them financially. It, it very much was seen as a victory by the Scottish Covenanters, and it reinforced their sense of resistance to the tyrannical power of the English king. But this conflict with Scotland stretched on for about a year with various truces and pauses, and the fact that King Charles was running out of money eventually forced him to call the English Parliament together, finally, uh, thus ending the period of personal rule. And when he did summon Parliament back, after 11 years of being uh, silent and, and dismissed, they had a few things to say to him. The King was unable to convince the English Parliament that he was going to respect them any more than he had in the previous 11 years, when he'd had absolutely no use for them. He basically wanted them to rubber stamp his demands for yet more money, which he was then going to spend exactly how he pleased, because he saw himself as having the absolute authority to do this. The result of this intransigent, stubborn attitude was that by 1642, England was plunged into a civil war. This civil war would last from 1642 until 1648 and it would be ruinous, as all civil wars are. The English Civil War was a direct result of the contempt that Charles I had shown since taking the throne in England. His insistence on the divine right of kings and his unwillingness to be bound by any sort of rule of law or English tradition of consultation with Parliament and the representatives of the people would be his ultimate downfall. But the English Civil War was also a product of the intellectual moment around this event. It was the product of England, which had been exposed very deeply to Protestant lines of thinking. These lines of thinking did not respect anybody just because you wore a papal crown or a political crown. Protestants were willing to hold even the Pope himself to account based on the Bible and what they thought that it meant. The idea that not even the head of the church was above the authority of God as found and understood in the Bible by individual ordinary people was a radical one. And if the Pope wasn't safe, then neither was the king. So the reflexive deference 
to somebody just because they were the Pope or the Archbishop or the King was an idea that was on its way out. That English people held their traditions of government to be larger and more important than any individual king. Charles I himself was going to have to be subordinate to the English understanding of how government should be done. The understanding of everyday individual English people. Now, England was not a democracy. I'm not attempting to suggest that it was. But this idea that we see working at this moment is the idea that all democracies are based on. That even the king was accountable to these structures which were larger than himself and which other people could see and measure him against. The English Civil War primarily pitted supporters of Parliament against royalists or supporters of the king. Now, the supporters of Parliament were largely Protestant, and many of them were that particularly virulent form of Protestant called Puritans. So the people on the pro-Parliament side are heavily Protestant and pretty extreme. The people who are supporting the king are often Catholic, but not always. So these royalists, they are people who believe in tradition. They believe that the, the king has a sacred office and that it's worthy of respect. And so they see that their primary loyalty as good subjects and good Englishmen is to support the king. Many of the royalists or supporters of the king were high church, which was a term that referred to Church of England, but of the very, very traditionalist, uh, almost indistinguishable from Catholic variants of practice. So it's not as simple as Catholic and Protestant in England. It hasn't been that simple for quite some time because we have this nebulous Church of England and this ongoing fight over what that should look like. It's a tug of war. But in very broad, very general terms, the people most likely to support Parliament were Protestant. The people most likely to support the King were traditionalist Church of England types and Catholics. Primarily, this was a conflict about where and how authority should be exercised or who had the final say in how things were going to be run in England. Royalists thought that all the authority came from the king down, that the king was in charge of the Church of England. He was the ultimate source of religious authority and organization and structure, as well as the head of the state. And so he was above parliament. He was above the church. He was above everything. That was the royalist position. But it didn't mean they were Catholic. Many royalists were suspicious of Catholics because they saw Catholics as being perhaps more loyal to the Pope than the King. So I don't want to give you the impression that, that royalists were, were, all, were even mostly Catholic. They weren't. This is primarily a conflict about who has the final say, who rules. So royalists thought the King was at the top of all the power structures in England. The parliamentarians thought that the king was not an absolute authority. They thought he had to be answerable to parliament politically, that he was responsible to representatives of the people for what laws were made and how things were going to be run. And they thought that he was responsible to representatives of the people in church as well, that he couldn't just dictate whatever he wanted in terms of religious practice, that there too he was responsible to the text, to the Bible, and to the understanding of the Bible that everyday people could see for themselves. He couldn't just say whatever he wanted and dictate whatever he saw fit. So the English Civil War was ultimately a dispute about where authority should rest. During the English Civil War, even parliamentary supporters were fractured amongst themselves. There were those who wanted to reform the Church of England in line with more Scottish Covenanter ideas, but there were also those who were called independents, and they thought that there shouldn't even be a state church to begin with. Having the king or the government involved in the organization of the church was fundamentally wrong-headed. They didn't want a state church at all. And one of the most famous independents who fought on the parliamentary side was a man called Oliver Cromwell. Cromwell is often described as a Puritan, as one of these hardline Protestant reformers, 
which he certainly was. But interestingly, he wasn't someone who thought that there should be a state church at all. And Oliver Cromwell could merit an entire episode on his own, but we're not going to talk about him in any great detail today. Oliver Cromwell is perhaps most famous for being something of a military genius. Uh, he builds uh, what's called the model army for the parliamentary side, and it's his tactics and his training that ultimately allow the supporters of Parliament to win the English Civil War. Cromwell and many of his supporters were derisively referred to as roundheads by people on the royalist side because of their short hair, which was cut in a sort of a bowl-like uh, style, whereas many of the royalists or the supporters of the king were nobles and they would sport the long curly locks that were fashionable for men at this time. But it's Oliver Cromwell and his hard-nosed, hard-headed military thinking that ultimately allow the parliamentarians to win the day. And Cromwell is perhaps the foremost representative of this new faction in England because he's not a member of the aristocracy. He's not someone who comes from a noble bloodline. He's someone who's very practical and who gets where he gets as a result of his abilities. But for all that, when the parliamentarians do win the Civil War, Cromwell becomes for a while Lord Protector of England, which sounds a lot like ruler of England who doesn't wear a crown, and that's basically what it worked out to be. And unfortunately, under Cromwell's authority, uh, Puritans got a really bad name in England because he would do things like try to enforce very, very reform Protestant ideas on families. And, and there are stories of his soldiers going through and taking people's Christmas puddings out of the ovens and throwing them into the street because some Puritans, these hardcore purist reformers, uh, thought that Christmas traditions in England were, were too Catholic and they had lots of things in them that weren't strictly biblical. And these things like Christmas pudding was one of them. And so th th they would make these rules or injunctions saying people shouldn't have Christmas pudding and they shouldn't play cards and they shouldn't do this and they shouldn't do that. And, and then they would try to enforce them. So as you might imagine, this was extremely unpopular and uh, Cromwell and his supporters and their zealotry uh, in support of making their version of Christianity something that was going to be enforced upon people had a lot to do with the next radical shift in English political history, but we're not going there today. The zealotry of Oliver Cromwell and his acolytes in attempting to enforce a very joyless version of uh, reformed Christianity on people made them extremely unpopular. But that happened after the end of the English Civil War, uh, when Cromwell is sort of appointed to be Lord Protector, and we're getting ahead of ourselves. When the English Civil War ends, the parliamentary side, Oliver Cromwell's side, is victorious. But there's a question. What now to do with the king, the figurehead of the royalist side which has lost the war? In 1649, King Charles I was put on trial by the remaining members of Parliament, all of them members of the parliamentarian side, and they put him on trial for treason. He was held responsible for intending to steal the liberties of his people with, quote, unlimited and tyrannical power. This was his crime. So even as a king, he was responsible for upholding certain freedoms and certain traditions of government that had been hard won in England. And his failure to do so was considered treason against his subjects, at least by those of them who were on the parliamentarian side. So the English built a scaffold and on January 30th, 1649, they beheaded their king. And this was an action that caused shock even in England, for although the Civil War had been clearly lost by the Royalists, many thought that laying hands on the actual body of the king and doing such a violent act was beyond the pale. And certainly other countries across Europe took note that if England had murdered its own king, 
who then was safe? It was a sign of a very radical shift in the limits of kingly power that had been sharply defined in England and might apply elsewhere as well. Monarchy in Europe has never been the same since. During the English Civil War, Scottish reformers in England were instrumental in shaping a document that has come to be known as the Westminster Confession of Faith. And this was essentially a formal declaration of Protestant identity in England, which put it very squarely in line with the ideas of John Calvin, i.e. Calvinist theology as we now know it, which were in circulation in Protestant countries across Europe. This confession became foundational for Presbyterian churches everywhere. Presbyterian churches originated in Scotland. The word Presbyterian comes from the word presbyter, which is an old church word for church elder. And it's significant because in Scotland, this is how church was run. It was run by assemblies of these presbyters or church elders who decided on issues of practice or questions of doctrine. So assemblies of representatives of the church are the ones that dictate policy in that organization. It sounds a lot like a parliament, doesn't it? And that's not an accident. It's a radically representative form of institutional organization. And this is the Scottish Protestant model of the Presbyterian Church, which had this influence in England and has become the model for Presbyterian churches that have since spread around the world. The point I'm making here is that ideas of how religion should be done and how politics should be done are intimately connected. And the authority of Parliament in England is not unrelated to the idea that the best government for a church is through a presbyter. Similarly, the government of a country should be done through a parliament. These are mirror images of each other. They didn't develop in isolation. They were part of the same shift in thinking. And this is a shift that was put into motion by the Protestant Reformation. That's why it comes up again and again as one of the most monumental shifts in European history and as one of the markers for a change into the early modern world as we know it today. A world in which the individual person is protected by rule of law and traditions and the authority of governments or rulers is not absolute. And that in churches, people should have a say in how things are done. It's an end to a, an absolute deference to authority and the beginning of the idea that individuals with their own understanding of things matter and ought to have an impact in how their world is ordered. The conclusion of all this is that Protestant ideas had seeped out of just critiquing the church and into reshaping the organization of the state. And we've just seen this unfold in England, but we're going to see it unfold in very many ways, many of them quite violent across Europe, as, this, as the implications of Protestantism like storm waves begin to break upon the walls of established political structures. The medieval order had vanished. Neither the Pope or the King was any longer the highest authority. Abstract concepts of God, rooted in readings of a scriptural text, were now to be held above systems of political and religious authority and traditions that had shaped Europe for centuries. This was mirrored in an emerging idea of political authority and organization that was above any individual ruler, both in church organization and in the organization of the state, the individual citizen would have a larger role than ever before. I hope you've enjoyed this whirlwind tour of English history on this episode. This is Villains and Virgins podcast, and our next episode, episode five, will cover the wars of religion in Europe. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing so you don't miss the next one, and do share it with someone else who you think would benefit from these ideas. I'll see you in the next episode.